All right, uh, this lesson, of course, is focused on the idea of what happens when people reject God, reject his truth. And while the overall picture is bleak, that's painted with that, because of what does unfold, we need to realize that not everybody has that attitude. Uh, not everybody takes that position. And there are people who are seeking to serve God, seeking to do his will, who want to uh, live by the truth and won't compromise with the world and go along with its standard. Um, in John chapter 18, we want to notice this overall concept or idea of truth very quickly. We know, you know, the word of God is true. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is true. John 17, 17. But when Jesus is on trial before Pilate here in John chapter 18, there, there's this exchange and the issue of truth or the truth is brought up. And it's interesting about Pilate's remark there. So let's just refresh our memories. John 18 verses 36 to 38. Who will get that for us? Go ahead, Jim. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, <clears throat> my servants would have Uh, my servants would fight so that I would not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king? Then Jesus answered and said, You said rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And 38. Of 38. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said the, this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. All right. So, as Jesus explaining, his kingdom's not a political kingdom, it's not a challenge to Rome, uh, there's no threat there. <clears throat> And Pilate asks that question, then, are you a king then? And Jesus answers in the affirmative, yes, I am. But he's king of what, as he mentions it there in verse 37 in the context of our lesson? Who's he king over? And what's his mission? What did he come to do that he states in verse 37? Speak the truth. And speak the truth. Bear witness to the truth. And the people who follow him are what? The people hear it. Okay, the people who hear that truth. So he came to bear witness of the truth. We know uh, John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He lived that truth. He was an embodiment of that truth in his life and his followers are people who love the truth they they come to the truth and as he says as it's commented in john chapter three you know there are some people who hate the light they don't want to come to the light but there are others who come to the light that their deeds may be exposed so they can see themselves as they truly are well that's the the light of truth and coming to the lord hearing that truth he says, that's my kingdom, that's my sphere, is truth. It's a kingdom of truth. Well, when he mentions that, then Pilate responds with that, what is truth? And people have tried to figure out, well, exactly what's Pilate's angle on that? Is he asking sincerely? Is he uh, showing skepticism here? Well, with what you see unfolding, to me, it, it looks like Pilate's being skeptical here. He's not asking sincerely because he doesn't continue a conversation with Jesus. Hey, you're bear witnessing to the truth. What is that truth? Tell me about it. Let's have a discussion. He says, what is truth? And he goes out to the Jews. Um, 
Now, why might Pilate be skeptical of the truth when he says, what is truth? That he hears Jesus out and believes what, what he says is, is valid, then he has to face the possibility of being convicted, having to live based on those convictions, and then being held in contempt of all his subordinates. He's in a position now to hand over Jesus, or he's kind of about to go through that. And so if he becomes aware of and convinced of the truth, and he plays anything but the skeptic, he's going to have to answer for that. He's going to lose any position or authority he has. Yeah, with specific reference to Jesus, he's, he's not inquisitive to follow this line of reasoning. Uh, he is definitely playing a political position. He sees that very clearly for himself, and he's, I think he sees the situation very clearly. And he's trying to negotiate through that to get Jesus off the hook, even to the point of scourging him and thinking, well, maybe that'll be enough. But as a person, why would he be skeptical? Why would he throw out this, what is truth? Have you ever known someone who's skeptical of truth, who thinks you just can't find it? Anybody? Jim? Well, that's what it seems where he's coming from. It seems like because he says those words, but he says it as he's walking away from Jesus. It's like there's no answer. Right, right. So you think about this, the, Nancy. Well, sometimes when you're talking with someone about um, scripture, it's not it, it's it's not so much that they're saying they don't know what truth is. It's that they're saying I don't know how you know that's what this means because somebody else says it means this. So in in fact, they are questioning what is truth but they don't put it in those words. It's just, what. Well, yeah, you say this, but when I study with these people, they say this. Okay. Like it can't be known. It cannot be known for sure. Right. And you think about that society that Pilate lived in, it was a society with conflicting ideas. And so who, who's actually true? Is it Plato? Is it Aristotle? Is it Socrates? Who... Who, who has truth? And now you're, you're telling me you're Jesus, you're, you're this itinerant preacher and of the Jews, and, and you're telling me you're bearing witness to the truth? Well, what is truth? Who, who can figure that out? And why should I believe you have that truth? Is he also questioning his authority? Who are you to say that you know what the truth is? kind of Nancy's who are you to say that you know what the truth is and I don't? You know, he's kind of challenging the authority of Jesus because he's, again, an authoritative figure. Mm -hmm. so. he, he could be doing that. Um, you know, when people, as, as Nancy said, and, and what I want us to see here is with Pilate and with us today and people we may encounter, it's, it's not a new phenomenon that somebody says, well, what is truth? How do, you, how do you even know what truth is? How do you figure that out? Because these people are saying one thing, these people say it another. You know, this, this religious group says they have the truth and they'll tell you one thing on the plan of salvation and these other people tell you another thing and these people tell you this is how you should worship and these other people tell you this is how you should worship. But it even broadens out, of course, in our society more and more like pilots in that you have radically different ideas of what reality is. Not just what is the truth of God's word. We're, we're into what is reality. You know, there, there's people out there in our society, and this I'm, I know you'll find this funny, there's people out there that, that literally think we're living in some type of computer program. Hank's seen it. 
Pe people actually believe we're living in a computer program. We're in the matrix. We're in a matrix. We're in a so they've, they've taken what's been put into science fiction and they think, well, that's reality. Hey? Yes, I, I haven't paid it up to get the bad heart and the bad back. Right. That's us really pretty. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, you think about that and you can understand we, we need to have a certain level of sympathy for people who have this position of pilot, this, this skepticism, the callousness. Well, what is truth? Because there's so much out there that is uh, competing and claiming to be, here's truth, here's, here's reality. So, you know, sometimes people then in that environment, when they encounter someone who declares very boldly, very straightforward, this is truth, what does it do to them? How do they react to that? It opens their eyes. Some people, it opens their eyes if they have an honest heart, but most people react how? What's that? They're offended by it. They're shocked. Who do you think you are that you know the truth? How can you be so sure of that? You know, they'll challenge that. And they'll think even less of you because... In our society, more and more, it, it's taboo to say, I know the definitive, absolute truth on this. Chris? I've actually had someone know very well in the past uh, when we were studying, trying to study with them, and they would say, well, how do you know that every word is true? Because it was a man who wrote it. Mm -hmm. Not understanding the inspiration of God. And then that's where they live and with the uh, background that they come from, they, they just don't understand. And they don't believe. They believe some of it. They don't believe all of it. Right. They, and, and we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. The idea you, you kind of want to pick and choose. But here's the thing. We, Jesus just plainly declared... I bear witness to the truth, and those who follow me, they accept that truth. And there will be some people who will accept it, as Gail said. Some people, their eyes are opened up all of a sudden because they give consideration. They look at it. They think about it. But then there are others who they don't like that at all. It makes them uncomfortable or angry. They're offended, whatever it may be. But we see that there is truth. And with that, let's think about this next point that he brings up, that there is evil in the world because if there's no truth, then there's no evil. But there is most definitely evil in the world. Uh, where do we first read about the concept or the idea of evil? What's that? In the garden. Yeah. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And where does that come up? The concept of evil. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took man, put him in the garden of Eden to tend to keep it. Told him you can eat of every tree of the garden. Verse 16, verse 17, but what? You can't eat of this tree. Which tree? Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there, right there, the first man, the first woman, the very first thing God deals with in the moral realm with them is there's good, there's evil. There's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Here's a tree you can't eat of, and it's going to separate good and evil. You don't eat of it. The idea is it's good. You do eat of it. It's evil. 
So there's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In Genesis chapter 6, Genesis 6, verse 5. If I could get somebody to read that for us. Genesis 6, verse 5. Caesar? Then the Lord saw the wickedness, wickedness of men were great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only you think. Okay. From the garden, when Adam and Eve partook of that fruit, they did something that was evil. And then you get to Noah's time, it says the whole earth is corrupt, and the, the man's thoughts, the intent of his heart, was evil continually. So it spread, and it's everywhere, except for Noah and his family, of course. When we get to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, Paul makes a comment here that's interesting, Galatians 1 and verse 4. Galatians 1 verse 4. Who will read that for us? Go ahead, Paul. Who gave himself for our sin that he might deliver us from his from this present evil age according to the will of God and Father. Okay, this present evil age. There was evil present at the beginning, there's evil present in the first century. And, of course, the world has not changed, so there's still the evil present now. The question is, what is evil? What is evil? What did uh, Joseph say to his brothers when they were worried about him getting revenge after Jacob died? Do you remember what he told them? You meant it for evil, but God meant it. Okay, what was it that he's referring to? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Well, they've been sending to murder him, first of all, but then the pit, and then abandoning him to the slave traders. Okay, selling him off into slavery. I mean, they had the idea of killing him. They threw him in that pit, but then they sold him off, and he says, I know you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So... Selling your flesh and blood into slavery is evil, <laughs> right? Um, in Judges chapter 2, verse 11, and this, we're not by any means going to cover every specific thing the Bible talks about as evil, but <laughs> Judges chapter 2, verse 11. Hank, you want to read that for us? <clears throat> And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served God. Okay. They go off into idolatry. That was evil, according to the word of God. Um, how? Okay, so selling a brother into slavery and being involved in idolatry, how would you... I'm trying to think of a way to ask it. Um, how would you define that as? Anyways, it's an action. It is a somebody is actively involved in doing something. It's proactive, if you will. In First Samuel chapter fifteen, when Saul is commanded to go and to kill all the Amalekites, to kill all the animals. And he comes back with the best of the animals, and he comes back with Agag. So he spared those. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, and verses 18 to 20, Samuel rebukes him for this. And he tells him in verse 19, why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? So not obeying the voice of the Lord, not doing what he commanded him to do, he says that's evil. So whether it's 
I guess, proactively going after sin, getting involved in idolatry, abusing a fellow human, or if it's not doing what God told you to do, the Bible outlines those things as being evil. And so that covers a lot of things. A lot of people can see selling their own flesh and blood into slavery as evil, right? Is it harder for them to see not doing something God said to do as evil? Yeah, in fact, we were just talking about that recently for someone who's trying to live the Christian life. You are con consciously working at not committing sin, not doing evil against the Lord. But the other side of that is sin of omission, which to me is more frightening than because the Christian is focused on trying not to commit sin. But the sin of omission, that's it, you know, that's what, what we were talking about. If you if you looked at if you could clearly see that side of what you're doing. Right. That's sobering. Well, one's an action, one's an inaction. They both can be seen. Yes, that commission and that omission. I used to hear that a lot in different teaching. Was there something else? Chris. But doing what's right and wrong on us. Oh. Yes, yes, we're going to get to that in just a little bit. So this, this idea of evil, either doing something, committing something, or omitting something. You know, forsaking the assembling of the saints is a sin of omission, right? It's not just the lying, the stealing, things like that, but there are other things we have to recognize there is evil. Now, the broader world struggles with seeing that this evil exists in the world. Some can see those sins of commission as evil. Certain ones, they, they recognize that that's wrong, but others they don't recognize. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, here's... One of the problems, and we're going to dig more on this concept here in a little bit, but Isaiah 5 and verse 20, Isaiah 5, 20. Somebody may actually have this one memorized, but Isaiah 5, 20, who will read that for us? Carl. What do those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter? Okay. So they call evil good and good evil. What does that do when there are people in positions of influence and authority calling evil good and good evil? What does that do for the society or those who are exposed to their influence? Well, it not only confuses the, the weak, it confuses the un, you know, the unbelievers. <laughs> okay, yeah. There's confusion that reigns. Because people don't, they, they can't grasp it. They can't see it when, when it's there. And they're, they're looking at it, observing it. Um, and so it causes a lot of problems. Sometimes evil is actually disguised as good. You think about where Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, how that the angel even disguises himself as an angel, or the devil disguises himself as an angel of light. Sometimes it, it's masked. And so there, there's confusion, there's a conflation between good and evil when you have a society that doesn't accept God's standard of truth. So there's problems that come along with that. Now, uh, when it's rejected, let's understand another standard is put in place. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Why would someone reject God's word as a standard in their life? Say they, they've been exposed to it. Somebody approaches them and talks to them. Why would they reject it? Philip? Philip? 
because they're not willing to accept the consequences that come along with accepting that. Okay. So Matthew 7, 13 and 14 gets at what Philip mentioned there. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Uh, who will read that for us? Michael. Enter by the narrow gate, the wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are a few who find it. Okay. So the way he describes truth, God's word, is what? He. What way is that? There's narrow. What's another way to describe narrow? What's that? Can't hear. There's few who find it. If it's narrow. Uh, Stephen, I also think of it in an area of being something that is confined or constrained. Christ constrains us. That is, he puts us into a condition of constraint and restrains us too, if we abide by the word. So we're not at liberty to engage ourselves in whatever pleasures we desire to pursue, but we are constrained because of the love of God. Okay. It is constrained, it's restrictive. They don't like what it would mean in their life, as Philip was saying. What, what does that mean? If I accept it, what do I have to change? What do I have to admit? What do I have to face and confront in my own life? Uh, what do I, what uh, differences are there gonna be? What's gonna be required of me now? So it's restrictive and it, as Ron said, we're constrained in Christ, but it's for our benefit. So let me give you an illustration. We have these little narrow lanes we go down to get from point A to point B, right? These paved roads, are they constrictive? Yes. Hey, I know sometimes we may not think it, but they're constrictive. But we can get on some of these and we can do 70 miles an hour and just sail along. What if you decided on most of these, in fact, I would say probably every single one of them, you decide, well, I want to keep doing 70, but I want to veer off that away. What's going to happen? <laughs> probably end up dead, right? You hit, a, you hit a building, you hit a vehicle, you hit a ditch, you hit a tree. It's constrained and we can move along Granted, traffic not being there. We can move along unimpeded. It's good for us. Right? And God's word constrains us to a path that we can move along. And it's good. We veer off of it, though. There's a problem. There's hazards there. And people don't like that. People want to just veer off whichever way they want to go. So question number two in the workbook was, if one rejects the word as truth, how else may he decide what is right and wrong? What do you all have there? Chris has one. I'm, he's already mentioned it. What is that, Chris? How do people decide what's right and wrong? Ron? The... Uh thought that I had is that, of course, they have to appeal to themselves, so they're appealing to human re reasoning and worldly logic. And you have talked about some of this previously, and even the ideas of people looking to science to be the answers to life. And it is not, because again, it's, it's part of the physical realm rather than the spiritual that provides to us true enlightenment. Right. Right. People want to look to their own reasoning, their own logic. And usually what that boils down to is how I feel about it. What, what do I like? What do I want to see? 
And so they, as the lesson talked about, people become their own gods. Well, I approve or disapprove of my own behavior. Well, if that's the case, I can pretty well do whatever I want to do. So for some people, it's their own personal feelings. What's another way people or societies try to establish a standard of truth? How do they determine what's right, what's wrong? As a society, uh, and one that is like a republic or a, a democracy, it's based on majority of decision. So you think about that in regards to our country and what we see happening. When the majority of the people are thinking along godly ways as our nation was established, then you have a general compliance to God's will. But when that's no longer the majority's way of thinking, then we're susceptible to, again, human reasoning and human logic and just the case that we see our nation heading headlong into. Right. So this concept of majority rule or the majority is going to know what's right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Exodus 23, 2, Moses had warned the people, God's warning them, really, you should not follow a crowd or a multitude to do evil. It doesn't matter how many people think it's okay or want to do it or participating in it. If it's not right, it's not right. But if you set aside an objective standard, very often that's what it will become. Whatever the majority say is okay is what the new standard is, or what decides what that standard is. There's another way as well that a society establishes here's right, here's wrong. Well, it can be through, as the writer of this talked about, is might is right. So if you have the strength to control the citizenship of a nation through military or through your power that you hold, then that also determines what's right. Exactly, exactly. So um, a biblical illustration of that is Exodus chapter 5, when Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh, and they say in verse 1, you know, the God of Israel says, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. What was, Mo what was Pharaoh's response? Do you remember? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? Pharaoh was a monarch who had power, and in his mind, he's the one who said what's right and what's not right, what's going to go what's not going to go, what the law is and what's a violation of law. And he, he said, who's the Lord? He did not recognize God as the standard. He looked at himself as a standard. Remember the actions he took leading up to this and making the things more difficult for the children of Israel, the action he takes after this, making things more difficult for them. He, he established himself as the power and used his taskmasters. And then later when they're leaving, remember he got his army together. He went out to get him because he thought he had the standard and the right to make that standard and to determine what was going to happen with those people. So, there's majority, there's the strongest, might makes right, as Ron mentioned. There's the, the false teaching that is out there uh, that people will look to or use because they like what they hear. You know, 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says people have itching ears. They'll heap up to themselves teachers, right? They, there are people who want to hear error, and so they'll say, well, that false teacher is the one Who's the standard? That false doctrine. So there are various ways, but when you leave the standard of truth, let's understand there's always a standard. Always. There is no such thing as an absence of a standard. It exists all the time. It's just, what is that standard? Chris? The, the first thing, and I'm not trying to go this way, but the first thing that I jumps out of my mind is politics because whatever side you're on they're going to appeal to the masses on what they want they're going to take their ears we can do this we can do that and we can make the changes so you'll be satisfied 
right or wrong. Okay. Yeah, exactly right. And you go back to the book of Judges. It says that there was a generation that arose, Judges 2, verse 10, that knew not the Lord. We read a while ago in verse 11, the very next verse says that the people followed the Baals, they did evil. The book of Judges repeats later, chapter 17, chapter 21, there was no king in Israel in those days, and what they do. Since there was, they did what was right in their own eyes. See, there was a standard, but it was a self-derived standard of truth that they had in those days. And standards are enforced. Um, 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, because in the lesson he talked about how a standard is enforced in some way or another in our society. And we're going to talk about our society in just a moment. But I want to point to a Bible example of where there was a standard other than God's word and it was being enforced. So 1 Kings chapter 18, let's read verses 1 through 4. Who will read that for us? 1 Kings 18, 1 through 4. Elijah. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, and there was a severe famine in Samaria. And Ahab had called Obadiah, who was in charge of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. <clears throat> For so it was while Jezebel mass massacred the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them 50 to the cave and had fed them with bread and water. Okay. What's the standard in the land of Israel at this time? What's that? Baal worship. Baal worship. And who's enforcing Baal worship? King. Ahab, but it specifically mentions who? His wife, Jezebel. Says she massacred the prophets of the Lord. So she's enforcing it. Right? And it's just this idea that there are people in positions of power when they set the standard, when they determine the standard, they enforce that standard. And there may be different ways, but it's not unusual for them to enforce it by putting people to death who do not align with it and who are advocating a different standard. Because the prophets of the Lord are saying, no, we need to follow the Lord, not Baal. <coughs> and she said, and this is a might makes right case, no, it's Baalism. And so she was massacring the prophets of the Lord. Uh, same thing can be said in Daniel chapter 3, right? Nebuchadnezzar says, here's an idol. Everybody needs to worship it. If you don't worship it, in the furnace you go. Now, in today's society, the standard that we see, what do you see as the standard? What, what is the general cultural standard, Philip? Humanism. Okay, humanism. And he mentions a particular word in here, Anita, a particular phrase. It's a two-word phrase, a description of it. Politically correct, political correctness. It was more in vogue when this workbook came out as, as a term, a buzzword in society, but it's still there. Political correctness is a label that's but it it's, comes, it's born of this humanist philosophy. And so question number four in the workbook said, what is political correctness? So what do you all have? What is it? Things you destroy the message of the righteousness to coerce Christians into silence and compliance. Okay. It's a weapon to silence people who are going to speak the truth. Um. Any other thing to add to that? Political correctness does not want open inquiry, does not want criticism, but it has an agenda behind it. Um, it seeks to redefine terms 
that either define sin and evil or that highlight good and right. So they want to change things. So this goes way, way back. Homosexual became what? Gay. Why? What's that? Hey, we're just happy people. Perversion became what? This may be a little cryptic. But you see signs like this. Love is love. You ever seen those signs? Love is love. Well, what they're saying is homosexuals, lesbians, whatever. Hey, just love is love. Murder, specifically murder of babies, became what? Women's health. Women's health. Pro-choice. Hey, it's just choice. It's just women's health. No, it's you're murdering a child. Hate became what? What, what, and this is, okay, if you disagree with someone, what are you described as now? Hate speech. It's hate speech. You're a bigot because you disagree with that person. Not that you've ever done anything against them. It's also described as an act of violence. Yes, now it's it's act of violence. I, I feel threatened. All right. You can this is true, this is literal. I'm not making this up, I'm not exaggerating it. You can wear a t-shirt that has a Bible verse or something on it, and somebody says, You're threatening me. All right? There was the other day I saw this. Now this is in Great Britain, but we're like two steps behind them. Great Britain, there was a preacher over there who held up a Bible verse, literally just standing outside an abortion clinic held, holding a Bible verse. He was arrested for holding up a Bible verse. So you think about that. They're redefining things. Well, that that's hate. That's hateful. That's that's violence. Chris? And in today's society, it's called woke. Yes. What was right is now wrong, and what was wrong is now right. Right. And it is accepted. Being, being a godly man is what? Toxic, toxic masculinity. Being a godly woman is what? Oppression. Oppression. You're a slave because you're submissive to your husband. Well, you're, you're oppressed, right? Now, if you go back, it's so funny. Like, if you watch TV shows from the 50s, that's what they highlighted. That's what they promoted. You know, the stay-at-home wife, she, she was taking care of things at home and the kids, and husband had his breakfast, had his lunch, had his dinner. Yeah. No more. No more. So they're redefining things. And yes, the, the new term is wokeness. So question number five, how does political correctness enforce its values? They pass laws. They pass laws. Gay marriage is a law. Okay, they do it through the state. Yes. Right? That's one way they do it. What's another way they do it? For example, companies are forced to retrain, brainwash their employees. Corporations. On how they should act and what they should say. They use the state. They use corporations. Elijah? Agencies. Agencies, what kind? Like FBI, CIA, ATF. Yes, all the agencies are being deployed to do that now. Uh, social media and or public opinion. Yes. Educational curriculums. Academia, right? Top to bottom. Top to bottom. All, all the way, right? Social media, news media, right? There. There is a definite um, agenda behind what's going on. In our society right now, that none of this is by accident. Now, I, I want you to understand, 
ultimately behind it, in who's moving it, is Satan. Satan's the one behind it. He's captured the hearts and minds of men, and that's what's ultimately behind this. But the people who are involved in it, they're very shrewd, and they use these things. And I also want you to understand, this, this isn't, okay, this is not ultimately about the United States. It's not. It's about the people of God. It's about us. That's Satan's target. He doesn't want people serving God. Now, whatever he has to use to get that done, he'll use it. And because the United States has been a bastion and a source and a beacon in this world of a moral standard, he set out to destroy it. And, it, and he's doing it. But it's ultimately about people serving God. He wants to eliminate that. All right? So um, we all know the, the terrible impact moving away from God's standard has had, and, and it's listed in the lesson. There are all kinds of problems in our society. But we want to realize God's way is right and best for man. Let's go to Deuteronomy 28. It's a good illustration. Now, this, of course, is speaking about the law of Moses, the children of Israel following the law of Moses. But the general principle is when a society follows God's law, here's what happens. When they don't follow God's law, here's what happens. So Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 4, who will read that? And this is just snippet here, but Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 4. Go ahead, Philip. Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments which I commanded, which are commanded you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And all blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall, you, shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Okay. And he goes on to list many others there. But notice how he talks about you do what the Lord commanded you to do, and here's what's going to flow out of that. You're, you're going to have blessings that overtake you. In other words, you, you can't run away from the blessings. You'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the country, wherever you live. The fruit of your body, you'll, you'll have children. You'll be blessed with children. You'll be blessed with families. The produce of your ground, the increase of your herds, cattle, offspring of your flocks. You're, you're just going to have an abundance because you're doing what God told you to do. You're following his will. That's the natural fruit of it. But when you get down to verses 15 and 16, what do we read? Deuteronomy 28, 15 and 16. Who's got this? Wrong. But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully his commandments and his statutes which I command you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city and cursed you shall be in the country. Okay. And he goes on to list a whole lot of curses. In fact, the rest of the chapter, all the way down through 68, he says, here's all the curses you're going to face. Your enemy's going to chase you. You're going to be driven out of the land. You're going to have all these problems. What he's stating for Israel here, and I understand they were a theocracy and they had a civil and religious law that was combined, but the principle is still true and always will be true, Right? Proverbs chapter 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, sin is a reproach to any people. That's the same principle. A society that follows God, and you look back in our country's history, that generally we lived a society that the undergirding laws were founded upon God's word. We prospered tremendously. But now we see what's happening when we turn from that. We're falling apart. And it's not going to change until we as a people get back to God, respecting and honoring 
his principles, his truth. All right, thank you all, Lord willing, lesson number seven next week.